Well, I'm really thrilled to welcome Peter Hinton to Carleton University. Um, Peter's here as the last of our Shannon lectures for this year on the series Performing History, Restaging the Past. Um, Peter's very well known as one of Canada's most respected directors and teachers. He's been directing classical and contemporary plays for the past 30 years, including in this past season, Bombay Black at the Factory Theatre in Toronto, Funny Girl at Seagull Centre in Montreal, and Pygmalion at the Shaw Festival. From 2005 to 2012, Peter was Artistic Director of the English Theatre at Canada's National Arts Centre here in Ottawa. And he's been an associate artist at the Stratford Festival of Canada, where, among other plays, he directed all three parts of his verse trilogy, The Swan. Peter's taught at the National Theatre School of Canada at Ryerson University and is currently uh, a professional mentor for the York University Canadian Stage MFA program in directing. And in 2009, Peter was made an Officer of the Order of Canada. His upcoming projects include his own adaptation, which is already creating a buzz in Canada, um, of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland for the Shaw in 2016, All's Well That Ends Well for the Shakespeare Company in, in Calgary 2016, and Peter's gift to Canada for its 150th birthday is uh, a production of the opera Louis Riel for the Canadian Opera Company. So welcome to Carlton, Peter. Thank you very much. So I'd like to begin by asking you just to talk a little bit about what attracts you as a director and as a writer to staging history in the theater. Um, I love how the theater uh, invites us to imagine other worlds. And, and history has always been a huge part of Western theater practice. Um, from the, you know Shakespeare to the, even in the Greeks, the examination of history has been imagined on the stage, and uh, so I, I love what the theater does. Like it, it invites us to think: How did people live? How did people see the world? How did people vision what a future would be uh, without knowing some of the things we know? And so, consequently, it makes us look at our own time through a, a very particular lens. And um, most of this work that I have done has been through the great privilege of working with actors. And, and actors have this job of trying to make ancient people live, breathe, and be alive as fresh as if they were today. And it's actors who always ask the most interesting questions of history. They ask, how do people go to the bathroom? And uh, what did women do on their period? Like these details of reality that we take for granted perhaps in our own lives, they ask these questions. And so put um, a chronicle or a very objective idea of history into a very uh, immediate, intimate, domestic, personal sphere. And so uh, I think that's exciting and a bit dangerous because it puts fact and subjectivity in a very, uh, open forum and shares it with people. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> you know, one of the things I find when I talk to people about what they enjoy about seeing history on stage is uh, they say they, they felt that they were in the past for the last couple of hours and there's that immersive experience that they really enjoyed. And yet a lot of the plays you've directed were from writers who found that a very difficult proposition and, and I'm thinking of Shaw or Brecht and people who actually developed strategies of, of preventing us from being immersed in the past. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that tension uh, between closing the historical distance between past and present. Mm. Um, it's a really good question. It's like um, one of my favorite phenomena to observe is um, period films. And if you look at, like, uh, the Elizabethan ones are really fun. Like, but if you look at, like, Betty Davis in Elizabeth uh, and Essex, for example, it has the ruffs, it's got the farthingales, it's got all of the signatures of Elizabethan dress, but it somehow looks really 1930s, 1940s. Like, Betty Davis walks around like this, like she could be smoking a cigarette. And then you look at Glenda Jackson in the 70s, and it looks very 70s. And this happened to me recently where I um, watched The French Lieutenant's Woman with Meryl Streep, the John Foles recreation of sort of gothic Victorian literature novels. And I remember in the 80s seeing this movie and thinking, finally they did a period film right. 
It's authentic. It really looks like the period. They didn't sell out to modern fashion. And I watched it, um, and it looked totally 80s to me. So there's some this strange phenomena that takes place where the attempt to recreate another world or another time gives us this incredible reflection of our own time. Um, I, the play I wrote, The Swan, which is set um, between 1796 and 1837, uh, I, I, I'm so frustrated because there, I, I, I did an enormous amount of research. I wrote it 20 years ago. And there is now all kinds of things that I see on YouTube about this period that come, have come forward since that time that I couldn't. Um, and to me, that play is very much a reflection of its own time. I can't look at um, Les Liaisons Dangereuses, Christopher Hampton's take on the Calderos de la Close, uh, you know, end of the French Revolution. That, it, to me, is an allegory about AIDS. Right. It's very much about um, England in the 1980s. And yet it's told so cohesively and convincingly through this constructed world of of uh, the French aristocracy before the revolution. So I find that tension is always dramatic and always interesting. When I directed Cabaret, um, you know, the Kander and Ebb musical about Weimar Berlin, that's as much about 1960s America as it is about Weimar Germany. In fact, a lot of it is more about uh, American anxieties, American aspirations in the early 60s. So that comes into play with it too. And that's, uh, I love that theater creates this weird double um, history, presence, uh, imagined world, real world, all at the same time. And you have to be a very discerning audience to navigate your way through that. Well, that leads naturally to Shaw and Pygmalion, and, and why did you choose to set that in, in contemporary society? Well, um, it, was, it was very innocent how it came about. I don't have a big developed theory about doing Shaw in modern dress, although I was curious that Shaw is rarely done in a contemporary costume. Uh, there's been a few experiments of setting it sort of in the 50s or moving him around his own lifetime. Uh, plays, you know, that were written in the 1890s get moved up to a First World War kind of setting, that kind of thing. Um, so I was curious about that. And um, uh, when you read Pygmalion, the first thing you get struck with are how many different versions of it there are. Shaw revised the play. Uh, he, he published five or six different versions of it, and then there are unpublished revisions he did between 1913 and 1941. And what I looked, when I looked through all of those revisions, one thing I noticed is he kept modernizing it. He wanted it to be a contemporary um, political didactic comedy. And most famously, in 1938, it was made into a film, and Shaw has the great distinction of being, uh, he won an Academy Award for his own adaptation of the play, is uh, that version he wrote is set in 1938. And there are motor cars, and he takes all of Higgins' um, uh, linguistic phonetics and modernizes it to radiographs and <laughs> things like that. And so really, in a kind of guileless way. I just thought, well, I wonder if you could do it now. And um, one challenge one has as a director, especially doing this repertoire that is so famous, is uh, you want to try to find a, a fresh way into it. Uh, My Fair Lady is right up there with Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet. Like you, The audience has a picture of it before they even come to see it. So I was interested in finding ways to see it anew, see it freshly. I, read a lot of reviews of Pygmalion from 1914 in which people were shocked. The play literally stopped in its first production because people were so uh, wildly aghast at what took place in it. And now it's such an old chestnut, like the most predictable thing in the world. I thought, how could one do that? So this idea of setting it now, um, I came across it kind of as an idea 
a uh, simple one. And then as I read the play with that in mind, it really started coming alive to me. And then as I started researching uh, the idea to see if it would hold, I became really surprised at how much I cling to the idea that history is linear and progressive, meaning that things were horrible in 1914 and they are much better now, which I've done enough plays historical plays, to know that's not quite as tidy and true as I would like it to be. And uh, when you come across, um, uh, you know, research and statistics which show that the gap between the poor and the wealthy in Eliza Doolittle's period and ours is greater now than it was in 1914, and one, uh, um, economics guy who told me that the likelihood of rising out of one's class is 20 times more difficult today than it was in 1914. All of a sudden the play took on this kind of danger and um, when you start including cultural diversity into the argument of Pygmalion, of Henry Higgins being a white guy trying to turn a brown um, uh, impoverished street girl into a duchess, it gets really dangerous in terms of questions about race and colonization. And to me, it is an enormous uh, romance of colonization, that play. So it kind of cracked open the play and took me right back to Shaw again and the roots of Shaw and the life force of Shaw and the uh, theatrical rigor of it. So um, it, it's how it works. Um, in 2013, I directed Lady Windermere's Fan by Oscar Wilde. And it's interesting because that play, that production was very modern in its approach. However, we did it in period costumes. And um, I'm very curious because critics, audiences, they're a bit more comfortable if you keep it in the period clothes. And I, and I think there's both a positive and negative thing to that. There's something about the security of costume that allows us to really enter the piece and also to keep it at a safer distance. This Pygmalion was very provocative. And you know, what was interesting is I had you know, uh, audience members come up to me and many people at the Shaw, the audience, they really went with it and really recognized its modernity. But there are those who were really offended by it and said, you know, there's no way uh, an Eliza Doolittle would exist today. Like people defending the social uh, programs of Cameron's government. And, and it, just by fluke, as um, you know, the elections were happening in Britain while we were rehearsing it, and there was a lot of it, criticism of Cameron's social mobility program that got, you know, set up in 2012. And when Cameron was asked, what was the secret to successful social mobility today? He said, elocution, elocution, elocution. Which I thought was so interesting in a play all about a guy who tries to transform someone by the way they speak. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting process with each play that um, uh, challenges one to, to think about how was the play perhaps received in its own time and what does that mean in presenting it today. Right. Great. Well, as I mentioned at the at the top, and we were chatting over the phone about this, that you're uh, going to be involved in opera, an opera yes. about Louis Riel. Yes. So I wondered what the challenges of presenting that history are, or the challenges of working in, in a different medium like opera. Oh, that one is a, like we could talk for hours about that alone. It's very complex because. Um, uh, Louis Riel is an opera written by Harry Summers and Mae Moore, who wrote the li libretto. And it was written in 1967 uh, to commemorate the centennial. And the COC and the National Arts Centre are reviving this opera for 2017. And it's never had a big major revival since its time. And it was the first originally commissioned Canadian opera uh, to be done by the COC. And that issue in itself is interesting because opera is the bastion of European-centered culture. And so new opera alone 
still to this day remains radical. And Summers and Moore chose to tell the story of Louis Riel uh, in centennial year, which is so interesting because it is not a sort of feel-good unity, uh, <laughs> we are a nation uh, kind of uh, propaganda thing at all. It really exposes the collisions of the Canadian um, uh, Confederation and it takes on Sir John A. Macdonald really by the jugular. And Sir John A. Macdonald's biggest problems were the French and the Indians. And so who is more of a nemesis threat challenge to McDonald but Louis Riel, who's both, who's Métis, of course. And um, in 1967, it was, um, it was challenged in its time, but it was more culturally acceptable for white people to tell this story. And so to now revive this opera and being a white person, um, I'm really placed with a huge challenge of uh, a very European cultural tradition telling a Métis story and a Canadian story and uh, really how am I going to bring other voices to the table? How do I make it inclusive so that we're telling this story uh, in a very uh, much more authentic way? And we have great th like thinkers now, you know, like Joseph Boyden, who's written this incredible book on Louis Riel and uh, Gabrielle Dumont. And it's, you know, what's so incredible about that book, if you've read it, it's a very slim tome for, you know, um, John Ralston Saul's Great Canadians series. And it cuts through all the big, huge books I poured through. That book manages to cut right through. And Joseph Boyden, um, as an Aboriginal person, cuts right to what the take on Louis Riel is, what the questions are, what's unknown about him, what propositions he still holds for us today. And um, I, I think it's a remarkable achievement. So uh, I've really got my uh, work cut out for me <laughs> in the next two years uh, of taking that story on. Well, right. well it's going to be exciting to see what happens. Yeah. yeah. So my final question is, is one actually we've been asking uh, everyone uh, who's come through to Carleton this term. And it's really given your work as a director, as a writer, as a, as a historian, what, what's your take on the relationship between history and, and performance? Well, I, come, I come, at, uh, come at this subject from someone who works in culture and uh, watches culture, absorbs it. And what always amazes me is um, how our historical education is informed as much from movies <laughs> and plays and books as it is from history. And um, <clears throat> so I, I feel like there's a great uh, interest there, that the people have an enormous interest in history. They love their own family stories. People want to know where they came from. People get very riled when you start uh, upsetting ideas about the past. Um, something I'm going to talk about tomorrow and deal with with the students here is, is very interesting to um, look at uh, people's responses to Pygmalion, for example, uh, critics, by how old they are. And what I found was that the younger the critic, the more game they were for Pygmalion to be re-examined. The older the critic, the more they felt the original needed preservation. And I mean, I'm generalizing. I haven't done all the <laughs> historical data study to prove that. But I think that's generally true. So there's another history that we have in mind. And what are histories, but they are our romances. There are our beliefs about how we think society should be, as well as that they are records of what actually happened. So you get um, into great arguments with people about how, like I, once at the National Arts Center, some, an audience member came up to me and she asked a very direct question. I knew what she meant, but I thought it was hugely complicated. And she said, why can't you just do the Shakespeare plays the way they were meant to be done? 
And, and, and I knew what she was talking about, really. She meant long dresses. She meant sort of vaguely any t set somewhere before 1900. And sort of assuring, they would assure us of the humanist condition and that humanity is a good thing. But what a complex question she's really asking. The way they were meant to be done. I said, what do you mean by that? What do you really, what does she think they're meant to be done? As though that exists somewhere that I can just go to, okay, Romeo and Juliet, how it's supposed to be done. <laughs> Enter Peter and Gregory and they're like, this. like it, it just doesn't work that way. And you know, recently at Stratford, there's been these wonderful experiments by Tim Carroll in what's called original practices, where they've studied in detail um, performance records and, and do the productions. You know, they're very famous, uh, Richard III, Done With All Men in a Twelfth Night. And um, the, the costume designer on those shows uh, uh, recreated buttons from molds that were made in 1603, to which Stephen Fry, who was in, <laughs> played Malvolio, said, well, what would happen if you uh, found a button mold from 1608? And she said, I wouldn't use it. No more that you, I couldn't stage a play set in 2015 with people wearing costumes from 2020. But in theater, you can. We do this all the time. And um, I, I find it a really interesting thing of um, what we think our history is and how we imagine it tells, gives uh, meaning to what the facts are. And, and I think, David, you and I have talked about for many years about what's accurate versus what's authentic. I, I once saw a production of um, As You Like It in which um, is a, you know, Shakespeare's uh, 1600, that play, 1599. And it, this production was set in the 1960s. And at one point, when Touchstone was going through all the uh, rules of courtship, he did a little joke about no smoking. And I thought, here we have a 16th century play set in the 1960s with a joke that would only be funny now all happening at the same time, and it all worked. Mm -hmm. Nobody was in collision. And that's a very interesting historical phenomenon, just like Betty Davis and the Elizabethan gear, that the way we perform history tells us what we believe it means. That's great. Thanks very much, Peter, for joining right us here at Carleton oh. and for the interview. My pleasure. All these insights. <laughs> it's it's wonderful. so fun to talk yeah. about all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks.